October 18th. When you hear someone being accused, even though it may be true, never add more accusations, but always say something positive and be sorry for the person. St. George Car Slides. Commemorations. The Holy Apostle and Evangelist Luke. Saint Peter of Cetinje, Metropolitan of Montenegro. Saint Julian the Hermit of Mesopotamia. Hieromartyr Manasin, Bishop of Cyprus in the first century. Martyr Marinus the Elder at Anazarbus in the fourth century. Saints Simeon, Theodore, monks, and Euphrosyne, who found the icon of the Mother of God in the great cave of the Peloponnesi in the ninth century. Saint Joseph, founder of Volokolamsk Monastery in the year 1515. Saint David, abbot of Serpukov in the year 1520. New martyrs Gabriel and Sirmidov of Egypt in the year 1522. Saint James the Deacon. Saints Isidore, Irene, and George of Crete. The Forty Children Martyrs. Saints Gwyn and Selivan, Welsh missionaries in Brittany. And finally, on October 18th, we commemorate the uncovering of the relics of St. Joseph of Volokolamsk. St. Marinus the Elder, he was from Tarsus and Cilicia in the years of Diocletian from 284 to 304. He was arrested because he was a Christian and was led to the Lord of the place Lysias, who after he was unable to restore Marinus to idolatry with various cruel tortures, finally beheaded him. The holy 40 children, they were martyred by swords. Saint Manasin, the martyr bishop of Cyprus, he was also martyred by the sword. And finally, Saints Gabriel and Kermidolis, the new martyrs in Egypt, these saints were martyred in Egypt on October 18th in the year 1522. Both were young, highly educated, and descended from pious parents. They slandered the emir of Egypt, Hire Mech, because they were throwing garbage and dirt into a Turkish mosque. They were led bound to the headquarters, where they were asked to accept Islam to avoid torture. However, because they firmly confessed Christ, they surrendered to the judge. But even there, they remained steadfast in their faith despite the flattery and suffered horrible tortures. Thus, both were martyred in the 25th year of their age. Kermidolis was killed with knives and stones, while Gabriel was beheaded. The Turks put their martyrs' remains in the fire twice, cremated them, and scattered them. Only those of the martyr Gabriel's cart were saved. A sequence of them is found in Codex 379 of the Patriarchal Library of Cairo. St. Peter of Cetinje, Metropolitan of Montenegro. Peter was born on April 1st in the year 1749 in the village of Nejegros. He entered the monastic order at the age of 12, following the death of Metropolitan Sava in 1782. Peter became the Metropolitan and ruler of Montenegro. This glorious man dedicated his entire holy life to his people. He
he worked with all his strength to reconcile the quarreling clans of Montenegro and strove mightily to defend the land and people from greedy aggressors. He succeeded in both tasks. He is especially glorified for his victory over Napoleon's army in Boca and Dalmatia. He was very strict with himself, and with everyone else, he was just, just and condescending. Peter lived in a small cell like a simple monk, even though he was a prince over the people. He reposed on October 18th in the year 1830. His miracle-working relics repose incorrupt in the monastery of Satinhe. The Lord glorified him in the heavens and on earth as his faithful and long-suffering servant. Saint Julian the Hermit of Mesopotamia, the year 367. Saint Julian, called the Hermit, was a Persian and an unlearned peasant, but because of the purity of his heart, he was a vessel of the grace of the Holy Spirit. He lived a life of asceticism beside the Euphrates River in Mesopotamia and possessed the gift of clairvoyance. In the same moment that Julian the Apostate perished, St. Julian discerned this in the spirit and declared it to his disciples. St. Julian entered into rest sometime after the year 367. More on St. Julian in the Euphrates River from the Synaxarion. St. Julian, a child of a poor family, lived in the 4th century AD. Although illiterate, with his living piety, he had been blessed by divine grace in order to acquire an abundant spiritual philosophy according to Christ of right faith, fine discernment and pure life, wonderful intemperance, oligarchy, sobriety, diagnosis of mental illnesses and dangers, prudent guidance and appropriate advice. Still a young monk, he had become famous for his wisdom and virtue, and to his hermitage, which was on the banks of the Euphrates River, learned men ran to take his advice and benefit from his words. He went to the holy Mount Sinai, where he lived as an ascetic for some time, but he returned again to his hermitage on the banks of the Euphrates and attracted many new disciples to the life of genuine repentance. During the years of Julian the Transgressor, Saint Julian supported and comforted many souls. His fame had spread so much that Saint Chrysostom praises him, saying that his name is even more brilliant than that of the kings. Thus, after his holy life, he peacefully surrendered his blessed soul to God. Venerable Simeon and Theodore, founders of the Holy Monastery of Mega Spleon. Simeon and Theodore were brothers, and they lived on Mount Athos under the guidance of Venerable Euthymios the New. They were ordained to the priesthood and were seen as wise teachers, distinguished for their asceticism. They later went to venerate the sacred places in the Holy Land visited Mount Sinai and defended the icons in Thessalonica and Thessaly. After a vision, they went to the great cave Megaspaleon in the Peloponnesi where they met with Saint Euphrosyne. That is where they found a miraculous icon of the Theotokos and they built a monastery. They traveled all over the Peloponnesi with their fervent preaching supporting the faithful in the orthodox doctrines and instructing their disciples. Having received foreknowledge of the end of their lives, they died peacefully and the relics became a source of healing. Their biographers describe them as the first famous ascetics of Mount Athos, organizers of monasticism, defenders of the icons, builders of churches, missionaries, and miraculous saints. Of these, Simeon and Theodore were brothers to each other and founders of the Monastery of the Great Cave, 
They were born at the beginning of the 4th century and after living an ascetic and devoted life, they died peacefully. Saint Euphrosine is the one who found the icon of the Virgin, which according to tradition was painted by the Apostle Luke and is kept to this day in the monastery of the Great Cave in the Peloponnese. All this, of course, according to the Order of Saints, which was published in Venice in 1706 and Athens in the year 1840 and 1911. The Holy Apostle and Evangelist Luke Luke was born in Antioch. In his youth, he excelled in his studies of Greek philosophy, medicine, and art. During the ministry of the Lord Jesus on earth, Luke came to Jerusalem, where he saw the Savior face to face, heard his saving teaching, and was witness to his miraculous works. Coming to the belief in the Lord, St. Luke was numbered among the seventy apostles and was sent out to preach. With Cleopas, he saw the resurrected Lord on the road to Emmaus. Luke chapter 24. After the descent of the Holy Spirit, Luke returned to Antioch and there became a fellow worker of the Apostle Paul and traveled to Rome with him, converting Jews and pagans to the Christian faith. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, writes the Apostle Paul to the Colossians, Colossians 4, verse 14. At the request of Christians, he wrote his gospel in about the year 60. Following the martyrdom of the great Apostle Paul, St. Luke preached the gospel throughout Italy, Dalmatia, Macedonia, and other regions. He painted icons of the most holy Theotokos, not just one, but three, and icons of the holy apostles Peter and Paul. Hence, St. Luke is considered to be the founder of Christian iconography. In old age, he visited Libya and Upper Egypt. From Egypt, he returned to Greece, where he continued to preach and convert many with great zeal despite his old age. In addition to his gospel, St. Luke wrote the Acts and dedicated both works to Theophilus, the governor of Achaia. Luke was 84 years old when the wicked idolaters tortured him for the sake of Christ and hanged him from an olive tree in the town of Thebes in Boethia. The miracle-working relics of this wonderful saint were transported to Constantinople in the reign of Emperor Constantius, the son of Constantine. More on the Holy Apostle and Evangelist St. Luke. He was a physician from Antioch, a disciple and traveling companion of the Apostle Paul, who refers to him as the beloved physician. He wrote not only his gospel, but also the Acts of the Apostles, dedicating both to Theophilus, who according to one tradition was the governor of Achaia, a convert. Much of the Acts of the Apostles is written in the first person, describing his own travels with the Saint Paul. He lived to an old age and died in Achaia, possibly in Patras. Most ancient authors say that he died as a martyr. Church traditions about St. Luke are somewhat contradictory. According to many, he was one of the seventy and thus an eyewitness to Christ's ministry on earth. He is usually considered to be the companion of St. Cleophas on the road to Emmaus. According to others, he never met Christ himself, but was converted by the preaching of the Apostle Paul. Church tradition holds that St. Luke was the first iconographer and painted an image of the most holy Theotokos from life. He is considered the patron of iconographers. Several icons attributed to St. Luke himself are still in existence to this very day. And from the Synaxarion, St. Luke the Evangelist, 
came from Antioch in Syria. He was a doctor by profession, but he knew the art of painting very well. In fact, the first icons of the Mother of God with the infant Jesus Christ in her arms are attributed to him, as well as those of the Apostles Peter and Paul. He was indoctrinated in the Christian faith by the Apostle Paul, and since then devoted himself to the preaching of the Gospel. He toured Dalmatia, Italy, Boeotia, etc. He wrote the third consecutive Gospel of the New Testament, as well as the Acts of the Apostles. He rested peacefully at about the age of 80. Later, the son of Constantine the Great, Constantius, ordered that the remains of the evangelist be transferred to Constantinople and be placed under the holy altar of I.N. of Saints Apostles, together with the relics of the Apostles Andrew and Timothy. Being a born student of God's word, you died with Paul, you enlightened the world, and you drove out the unclean. You wrote the divine gospel of Christ. We bless your right hand, Luke the theologian, through which we believers have the word of God, two holy tablets and the seventh icon of Amphipus. A hymn of praise, St. Luke the apostle and evangelist. The divine Luke, both wise and learned, was tortured willingly for the Lord. He could have avoided mockery and torture, but the world would not have had the great Luke. The young Luke beheld God's truth and surrendered his heart to the Son of God. He hearkened to the teacher, beheld the wonder worker, and in him he recognized the immortal creator. He beheld the resurrected one and spoke with him and worked miracles in his name. Christ became his only joy, and Luke sacrificed his mind, wealth, and youth to him. When Luke became old, he was young in Christ, and gave to the world what he received from the Lord. And when he had given the world all he could give, then the world, fulfilling the scripture, repaid him with contempt. From an old olive tree the aged Luke hung, with a smile on his face and his arms folded crosswise. And the hand of Christ came down from heaven and received the soul of his evangelist. Now, in a radiant paradise with the other apostles, Saint Luke prays for the Holy Church. Reflection can a sinner repent of his sins in ten days according to the immeasurable compassion of God he can during the reign of Emperor Maurice there was a well-known bandit in the vicinity of Constantinople he inspired fear and trembling both within the capital and without one day the Emperor Maurice himself sent the robber a cross as a sign of faith that he would do him no harm if he surrendered. The robber took the cross and surrendered. Arriving in Constantinople, he fell before the feet of the emperor and begged for forgiveness. The emperor kept his word, had mercy on him, and released him. Immediately after that, the robber became gravely ill and sensed that death was drawing near. He bitterly repented of all his sins and tearfully prayed to God that he forgive him just as the emperor had forgiven him. He shed so many tears at prayer that his handkerchief was completely soaked. After ten days of weeping and praying, the repentant man reposed. The same night he passed away, his physician saw a wondrous vision in a dream. When the robber had given up his soul, there gathered around him black, man-like demons with pieces of paper on which were written all his sins. Two radiant angels also appeared. The angels set a scale between them, and the joyful demons placed all those papers on it, weighing down their side of the scale. But the other side was empty. 
the angels held counsel. What shall we place on it? Let us seek something good in his life. And then that handkerchief soaked with tears of repentance appeared in the hands of one angel. The angels quickly placed it on their side of the scale and it outweighed all the demon's papers. Then the black demons fled, howling sorrowfully, and the angels took the soul of the repentant thief and carried it to paradise, glorifying the man-loving God. O Lord our God, who hast honored man with thine image divine, and endowed him with reason, and who givest wisdom to those who ask, do thou thyself now look down upon me, thy servant, and enlighten my mind and establish my heart to receive instruction, to be diligent in study, and to achieve good success with the aid of thy divine grace. Grant that I may employ my learning unto every good work and follow thy holy and perfect will, favorably unto thy good pleasure. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who loveth mankind with the pure light of your divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of thy gospel teachings. For thou art our God, and to thee do we offer up glory, to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Acts, chapter 8. The first general persecution. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. In the liturgy of St. Basil, we proclaim God as one who makes the evil to be good. In other words, God uses the sins of man for good and holy results. Here, the scattering of the disciples during this persecution led to the spread of the gospel to other areas. Saint Stephen is sometimes called the proto-martyr or first martyr, as he is the first believer to be killed in the name of Christ. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. The church in Samaria. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great. Being a sorcerer and dazzled by Philip's healings, Simon converted for reasons other than faith. He would later try to buy the power to work miracles, and according to tradition, he afterwards returned to his magical arts and was a bitter enemy of the church. He was claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God, and they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the king, kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Philip the deacon is the first to evangelize Samaria with the gospel of Jesus Christ, bringing both teachings and healings. The eager reception by the people is due in part to the foundation laid by St. Fotini, the Samaritan woman 
of John 4 who brought news of the Messiah before his crucifixion. See John 4 verse 39. The Samaritan Pentecost. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The unity of the church is shown by new communities being under the authority of and in communion with the church of Jerusalem. In the church to this day, all communities in a given area are united under the authority of a local bishop who is in communion with all other bishops of the Orthodox Church. Who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish it with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this, you are wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Baptism and Chrismation anointing for the reception of the Holy Spirit were considered two distinct sacraments from the beginning. The phrase baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus should not be understood to mean that the Trinity was not mentioned at the time of baptism. Do not imagine that because the names of the Father and the Holy Spirit are sometimes omitted when the Apostle speaks of baptism that the invocation of their names has been omitted. St. Basil Sometimes the Bible speaks of baptism in the Holy Spirit and sometimes of baptism in Christ to emphasize certain points. Always we are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. St. Basil, see Matthew 28, verse 19. Specific reference to baptism in Jesus Christ was not intended to neglect the Trinity, but to distinguish Christian baptism from John's baptism of repentance. Faith must be accompanied by a total change of life, or it is worthless. Simon believed on a certain level, but he was not justified because he was poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans the Ethiopian eunuch. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and with coming to Jerusalem to worship. Eunuchs were men who were castrated, whether by birth defect, disease, or mutilation, and were often employed to guard women of nobility. This eunuch had a thorough knowledge of Judaism and was likely a Jewish proselyte or convert. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? Because the scriptures have a specific God-given meaning, it is impossible to truly understand them apart from the church, for apostolic interpretation is held in the consciousness of the church. And he said to him, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up with him and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, 
and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. This passage from Isaiah is prayed by the presbyter as he prepares the bread for divine liturgy. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and, beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Again, the Old Testament is the foundation for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Such is the power of the Old Testament that if anyone would apply himself to the study of the prophets, he would need no miracles. St. John Chrysostom Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities until he came to Caesarea. From the beginning, baptism in water and faith in Christ are both essential for entrance into the New Testament church. The apostolic pattern of conversion in Christ is hearing, believing, and baptism. Contemplation Contemplate the miracle of the Apostle Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Contemplate how an angel guided Philip from Samaria to the road into Gaza. How Philip saw the eunuch of Queen Candace, explained to him the prophecy of Isaiah, and then baptized him. And then contemplate how an angel made Philip invisible to the eunuch and transported him instantly to the town of Azotus. Luke chapter 10 verses 16 through 21 This passage is read on April 25th, the Feast of the Apostle Mark, and on November 8th, the commemoration of Holy Archangel. He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and that nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. I saw Satan fall describes an event that took place before the creation of the world. Five times Satan will set his will against God. See Isaiah 14 and Revelations 12. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. Babes here refers to people of simple faith and open hearts. Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 through 18. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. 
Paul expects the church to be at corporate prayer often. Not only are the apostles to speak the mystery of Christ, but every member of the church is to have speech with grace so as to answer those seeking the true faith. Greetings and Instructions Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. Tychicus is the courier for this letter, as well as for those to the Ephesians and to Philemon. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts with one sinus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will make known to you all the things which are happening here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a bond servant of Christ greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphos, and the church that is in his house. Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. Paul expected his letters to be read aloud to the churches and at at least sometimes to be sent on to neighboring churches. Colossae and Laodicea are less than 15 miles apart. Paul's letters coming from Laodicea probably is one we know as Ephesians. This salutation by my own hand, Paul, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. A homily on the sins of the tongue. I said, I will guard my ways, lest I sin with my tongue. Psalm 39, verse 1. The sin of the tongue is the most common and most frequent sin. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, says the Apostle James. James 3, 2. When a penitent sets out on God's path, when he begins to live according to God's commandments, he should first strive to avoid sin with the tongue. That was the rule that the penitent David laid down for himself. He vowed especially to remain silent before his adversaries. I will restrain my mouth with a brittle while the wicked are before me. Psalm 39 Behold, a most wonderful rule for one who is being healed of sin. When he is accused, he does not reply. When he is slandered, he remains silent. In truth, what does it help to speak with an enraged, unrighteous man who does not love God more than himself? If you speak to him of evil, you will enrage him even more. If you speak to him of good, you will make him a mocker of holy things. Before Pilate, Christ remained silent. Pilate said, Answerest thou nothing? Mark 15, verse 4. What can he reply to you when you do not have ears to hear or a mind to understand? Behold, the silence of the righteous one before the unrighteous one can still have the best influence on the unrighteous one. Left to interpret the silence of the righteous one by himself, the unrighteous one can interpret it for the benefit of his soul. While any other answer, good or bad, will be interpreted for evil, to the condemnation of others and to the justification of himself. 
Blessed is he who learns to govern his tongue. O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, thou who hast shown us by example how and when to speak, thou hast shown us by example how and when we should be silent. Help us by thy Holy Spirit that we not sin with our tongues. To thee be glory and praise forever. Amen. Τη παρησία την προσέ, μη ει κρίμα ή ει κατάκριμα. Έτσι προσφέρω μεν στην λογική βάθμη λατρεία, υπέρ των ανεφίστην αποξαμένων προπατόρων, πατέρων, πατριαρχών, προφητών, αποστόλων, κοινίκων, ευαγγελιστών, μαρτύρων, ομολογητών, εγγραφευτών και παντό πνεύματο δικαίου εν φύση τα τελειωμένα. Υπότιτλοι AUTHORWAVE